Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, which is available as a paperback and audiobook, and the ebook is free, free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Uh, for more information about the book, more information about me, more information about everything that's good in this world, interviews with literary agents, editors, authors, all the world's best people, go to middlegradeninja.com. Uh, my guest this morning, a rare morning show rather than an evening show, which is why you'll notice my background is different. You can see my son's art in the background Aww, if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, but my guest today is none other than Kathleen Birkenshaw, and I am thrilled to talk with you. Kathleen, how are you this morning? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm so happy to be on your show today. Thank you for having me. I uh, couldn't, couldn't be more thrilled and a little nervous to talk to you. I've been uh, doing uh, research all week and wondering how am I going to ask questions about a subject that's, that's just so big. But we'll, 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 we'll get through it uh, the best we, we possibly can. I'm mostly just going to let you do the talking, and that will be the easy way to do things, I think. Uh, so esteemed audience knows I never summarize anyone's book or anyone's background. Uh, so the best place to start is usually, if you would, give esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background, and we'll go from there. I'd be happy to. Well, I am a Japanese American author and um, I didn't start out writing books. Actually, um, of course, when I was younger, I did a lot of poems, a lot of cards, but um, I loved blue book exams in college which everybody thought I was weird because of that, but I just loved to write. However, my job really that I got into was healthcare management and I did negotiating contracts between physicians and hospitals and I set up physician hospital organizations. So most of it was like business contract writing. Um, and then it kind of turned into having to do writing because of my health. And I guess you want me to just kind of jettison right into that? Um, Oh, okay. Um, well, first, I guess I should tell you about the book. Sorry. The Last Cherry Blossom is based on a young girl's life in Hiroshima during World War II. Um, and it's based on my mother's experiences. She was 12 when the bomb was dropped. And so in the book, you kind of get a feel for life during that time, uh, and as well as family life and the propaganda that was given to their own people in Japan, as well as seeing, you know, the, the horror of August 6th through her 12 year old eyes as well. Uh, and the way that the book kind of came about was really more so of, I started speaking about my mother's experience first, but it wasn't for a long time. Uh, my daughter was in seventh grade, so that was about 10 years now. And she came home from school, very upset, and she said, you know, we just finished World War II, and I overheard some kids talking about that cool mushroom cloud. Can you go and talk to them about the people under that, like grandma? And I remember calling my mom that day because I felt she was going to say no. She's very private, and she never talked about it. And in fact, I was 11 when I found out she was actually from Hiroshima. She always said she was from Tokyo. And I remember growing up that she'd have these horrible nightmares throughout the year, and especially in August. And when I was 11, I happened to remember the summer before, August was very bad with nightmares as well. And so I kind of just kept asking her if something happened then. And finally, she told me that she was actually born in Hiroshima and uh, not Tokyo, but she lost her family and her home uh, to the atomic bombing that day. So after that, she didn't want to tell me much more. It was still painful for her then. And, and then she said, don't say anything to anyone. So at 11, I really didn't know a lot about the atomic bombing until we started to read Hiroshima by John Hersey. That was really my first idea of what she might have gone through. And I just remember being in my room and, and, and being horrified and so upset that some of that she might have seen. And I remember going to her, she didn't even look at the book. And she just said to me, well, no words can truly ex explain what happened. And don't tell your teacher I was there because I can't go in and speak about it. So again, nothing was really done with that until I was 31. I got very sick and I was in the hospital for over a month. So when I came home, I needed help taking care of myself. Uh, and my daughter was four then and my husband worked during the day. So my parents would come over and I was diagnosed with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, 
which is a neurological chronic progressive pain disease that affects your um, immune system as well as your sympathetic nervous system. And my physicians, when they first diagnosed me, and they also said that it's because partly of my um, immune system deficiency because of the radiation my mother was exposed to during the atomic bombing. And at that point, I had to stop my career of what I was doing. I wasn't sure how I could be, how much of a good mother I could be if I wouldn't be able to walk or use my hands. Um, and I became very depressed and despondent. And my mother then started to talk to me about August 6th and the days afterwards. And she told me that she wanted me to know this because she wanted to commit suicide, that was her plan, after she lost everyone. But she was so glad that she didn't do it because she had me and then she had my daughter, Sarah. And I had that same samurai blood flowing through me and I'd find that strength somehow to make a new life. So by getting sick, that was one of the ways that I actually found out more of what happened to her and it was kind of like, I think it's a typical mom thing. You want to do that to help your child, but at the same time, I could help her so she could finally talk about what happened. And then life kind of gets in the way. And so nothing really more was done with that until that day that I'm you know, calling my mom. And she actually said yes. And that was surprising to me. But what really made her think about it was that the kids in her class, they'd all be around the same age she was because she was 12. And she figured, well, maybe they'll understand or relate to me better about my life of what I was doing. And they're all gonna be voters. So she said this way, they'll walk away knowing nuclear weapons you know, should never be used on anyone again. And so I went into the class and I talked to them and I remember being invited then the following year to the new seventh graders and other schools in the Charlotte area, heard about it and had me speak. And a couple of teachers approached me asking, you know, do you have anything we could use in the classroom? Because we don't really have anything on the Pacific side. And I had written stuff down just so my daughter would have it someday, you know, for the history. And um, I remember calling my mom and she was just so surprised. You know, her first thing was, I'm, why would they want to know about a little girl in Hiroshima? And, you know, it, it was just interesting that that's what her first thought was. And a few days later, she sent me this package and it was a copy of a picture, which is this one over here. That is a, a picture that always had a special place of honor in my home. Um, and it's of her and her papa. And it's special for quite a few reasons. The first one um, is she only had seven pictures from her childhood. They were all of her between the ages of three and five. Um, they were at another home, so they weren't damaged by the bombing, but anything older than five uh, was destroyed with her house that day. So, but this one especially is her papa was her favorite person in the whole world. And um, I could tell by the way she'd talk about what he did with her and the memories that he loved her a lot too. And so I decided at that point that it would be a book that wouldn't start with the atomic bombing, but it would start months before. Because I felt that um, one, I wanted to show what she had so you can understand the loss, but more importantly, I felt that readers needed to know the culture and the mindset of that time period because it was, you know, their way of looking at leaders was very different from the United States, the allies. And the way of life at that point was, you know, they had invaded Manchuria in 1931. My mom was born in 32. And so she only had war as the background to her life. So by the time 45 came around, um, the soldiers that used to be in this strong military port in Hiroshima, they were mostly deployed out into the Pacific. So there weren't many left. There weren't many men left. It was mostly older people and children. Um, but I also, in order to show what was different for them, I just wanted to show too what they had in common. I mean, the children, you know, my mom is, was, would talk about how, you know, she worried about her family and her friends, uh, what might happen? Would they get a bomb dropped on them? Um, would they survive it? And then wished for peace, you know, and, and I feel that all the allied children, you know, that was their thoughts, that was their wishes and hopes and worries. So I wanted to show that there was that commonality that was there because I felt that, you know, in the textbooks, a lot of times, if we're lucky, it's a two paragraph thing. 
And it usually is, we dropped the atomic bombs and we won the war. And to me, that is just so disrespecting to all those people that died as a result of that, to just dismiss it as a way to end the war. I wanted them to get a better feeling of what happened so that um, they might gain more empathy towards it. it. It would give you more of an emotional impact than just those two paragraphs and that famous mushroom cloud picture that they usually include with that. Um, so I really had hoped that children could get that, but also the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, whoever does read it, my hope too was to show them that even today, even though it's 76 years later, it'll show you that, you know, the ones that we feel don't belong, don't look like us, are our enemies, they're not really that different from us. I mean, we all have hearts, we all have emotions, we have that common bond as human beings, and that's mostly what I hope that this brings about as well as, in, you know, to no more use of nuclear weapons. But I really wanted that to be the message too, because I feel if you're going to talk about not having nuclear weapons, you need to talk about why. You need to talk about this is what we know happens. And now we know it can be so much worse. Um, and so that's what kind of pushes me uh, with the book um, and with uh, my mother's message for that. I might have gone off track, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> I might have veered a little well, you're bit. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> if I'm a esteemed audience, I'm annoyed that I'm also on the show. You're doing great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, uh, I've did. i got a bunch of questions for you. I, I should point out, uh, if it, esteemed audience, if you're listening to us the day this comes out, it's August 7th. Uh, so we're one day past the 76th uh, anniversary. If you're listening to us later, welcome. We're, we're glad you found us. When, whenever you made time for us, is fantastic. Um, and so we're talking, uh, is it fair to say that you're on a mission to, to spread awareness, uh, to prevent, to, to do your part to, to prevent this from, from happening again? Yes, I definitely am. That has been my new mission um, that I can do. In between my, my illness, that is my hope to continue with this along the way. Well, let's start there, because uh, we are 76 years later, uh, and we know how technology improves. Uh, remember, 1945, there's no cell phones. Uh, there are no Nintendos. Uh, technology has improved significantly since then, and that's the, the weapons that we know about, um, not, not the classified ones. So this remains a, a very real concern, and I'm, I'm certain that what could be released now would, would be even would, what happened in in, uh, in 1945 is, is, is unimaginably horrific. Um, and that the, the stakes, I, I imagine, have only gotten higher in that regard. So obviously, we want to reach out to I love that you're focused on uh, younger people and future voters. But what can uh, citizens actively do to help prevent uh, an, another nuclear launch? I think the more that they can find out about nuclear weapons, the more they can find out what they can do, um, and then read on the people such as not just the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, but you also have the atomic testing survivors and what has happened to them in Bikini Atoll and, and in uh, the other areas of the United States where they first tried out the atomic bombing. Um, but also, I think what they need to, to understand is, well, at least that's how I feel, is that they need to make that connection to those people, to that connection to the idea, you know, that I could be that person, that could be my family. And I think that by having that, because as you said, you know, technology does change, the way we do meetings change, you know, this past year, there was huge changes. But that need for connecting with another human being, that's timeless to me. You know, and, and I feel that the more that we focus on that, then the idea of using nuclear weapons makes no sense once you get to that point. And I think, you know, there's no such thing as a small nuclear weapon, you know, that, that that's still going to do so much damage. One of the things that I do also talk about in my talks with students is that um, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima had the strength of 15,000 tons of TNT and it, it did so much damage and it killed um, over 150,000 people over the five years afterwards. Uh, but the largest one that we know of that is in our arsenal today has the strength of 1.2 million tons of TNT. And it amazes me to think that we need, that they feel something so large is 
what we must have. And it's also the fact that even if we didn't deploy it and it was used, I give them this example that I've heard before on the BBC is that if India and Pakistan each used an atomic weapon against each other, maybe even a little bit smaller than the one dropped on Hiroshima, there'd be so much smoke in the stratosphere, it would block like 10% of the Earth's of the sunlight to the earth. And that would affect everyone around the world. So it's not just the fact of one obliterating the other, which is horrible enough, but even if you wanna say, well, we didn't do it and it's over there, it, it no longer is, well, it happened over there, it won't affect us, especially since so many people now have them. Uh, and, and I think that sometimes we get away from the fact of the humanity. And there's a lot of talk about numbers and um, how expensive it is and the politics, but they get too much away from the actual people and what they had gone through. Um, and, and that's what I hope to bring is that human aspect. I'm not a scientist. I know bits and pieces of it, but I can bring that human humanity and that emotional piece of it to remind them, you know, that such a, a smaller bomb killed 80,000 people immediately. Some just evaporated because of the heat was so intense. There's nothing left of them. Um, my mother lost her whole family that she knew her best friend that day. Um, and, and I think they need to realize that they were just going about their lives. And you have to kind of realize whenever you use some kind of weapon like this, you're hitting the citizens, the people. You may dislike or even hate the leaders, but you're not affecting them. You're affecting the people. And just as we someday could be subject to it as well. Um, I've been so lucky to speak with um, thousands of students especially through Zoom uh, around the world. And the one thing they tell me after I speak is that moved them to want to make action, to want to find out more about nuclear disarmament is not the statistics, not the info about the treaties, which are all important, but it's that story of that little girl because they could see themselves in her. They could see that be their family that they lost, their best friend. And that's what then makes them want to talk to their parents about it, who are voters now, who can look up more information about it. And the more that the people talk about it and realize, I think that eventually it can stop what we're doing. Um, there's going to be steps and it's not going to be easy, especially because the United States, we, you know, U.S. and Russia have the most nuclear warheads. And um, even though there was a treaty that was signed by the United Nations and ratified uh, about uh, not using nuclear weapons and making them illegal, the United States and Russia did not sign it. And neither did Japan because Japan kind of falls under the umbrella of the United States. So they wouldn't go against that. And, and it, it is seeming like an uphill battle at times, but I think that the more that we talk about it, the more that we remember what happened and put that in front of people that it can't help but soak in eventually. And I just hope that, you know, when I'm not able to do it anymore, that my daughter can do it. And that in some small way, you know, we keep their memories alive because their stories can't die with them. Um, there's not many survivors left anymore. And we need to make sure that by telling their stories, I hope it tells that the readers that their stories are important, whether they're immigrants, whether they're from war-torn countries, that their stories matter and they need to be told too. And I think if we start focusing more on each other and our stories and, and us as people, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's kind of Pollyanna, but I really feel that eventually then maybe we will see certain things should not exist any longer, like weapons of mass destruction. So. 76 years later, I'm talking to you and you're being impacted by an event that you weren't there for. I'm sure that there are, that the, 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 the death count has to be um, severely undercounted uh, for that event because God knows how many cases of cancer and, and other uh, diseases long after and, and people who are still suffering, probably still uh, contracting poison from, from certain areas there. So we may never know what the, what the total toll was. Um, I do something that, that catches me, and I'd love to know your thoughts on this, is like I said, we're, we're 76 years later. We know that um, humanity is, in a sense, had a, had a loaded gun pointed to our head um, uh, all, all of this time. That has always been some level of threat, um, but it has not happened. So when we're talking about a, a Pollyanna event that we haven't had a total nuclear annihilation, knock on wood, as of uh, this recording, um, 
does that give you hope or is there is that dangerous to have hope to say that it hasn't happened yet we need to keep constant vigilance to continue that and why do you think maybe it hasn't happened wow that's a very good question um okay well i guess in a sense i could say i'm a little hopeful because it hasn't happened i'm hopeful because it's still being talked about at least whether what for whatever the reasons are behind it in politics it's being discussed it's being brought out uh and being brought out in the open so i'm hoping that because of that that can help with some deterrence but at the same time I worry because you know we're we're we are tempted to remake the same horrific mistakes. You know, we we found that with the Japanese internment, and then you know with the idea of um, what they're doing now with the people who are coming in from Mexico and putting them in places. And and it's like, well, we didn't really learn from one instance, and we're still doing it. And so it scares me that the longer we go, if we don't start making some clear progress, um, you know, back in the I think it was the 80s when we had Gorbachev and Reagan. I mean, they at least started to reduce the nuclear weapons. They realized that, you know, nuclear war is not something that's won by anyone. Even if you're you're not attacked, nobody really wins in that case. I just wish that we could kind of get back to that focus. Um, and we're trying to. I mean, they, they've got things now as no first use that we're trying to get past, that we won't be the first use to, to do it. It would only be as a reactionary. But at the same time, the longer we're away, from what happened, the older our equipment and the missiles are. And so the more you're a chance of something going wrong. And there have been close calls throughout the years. Um, even in North Carolina, I think it was near Greensboro, uh, it was in the, I think it was the 70s, the, there was a plane that was carrying um, atomic weapons and something went wrong and it fell. But luckily the switch thing didn't turn on, so it never went off. So there are these near misses that happen and miscommunications happen between countries sometimes. And that's the concern as well, is that the older this equipment is, um, the more chance that you have of somebody getting into it. And then if you update the equipment, you also have a chance nowadays that someone could hack into it. And so by just one small thing, to think of how many thousands of people could die because of that, um, it, I think it's there there's hope and at the same time there's well we're kind of down a ticking clock here because we don't know what could happen accidentally as well as just intentionally there is a wonderful 60 minutes piece i came across when i was doing uh, research for the the book of david uh which which, which features some nuclear launches it's one of the most uh, horrific uh, terrifying things i've ever seen i'll link to it and it's a tour of a uh, of a modern facility for a nuclear launch and they go there and the, the door is propped open with a crowbar uh, they've still got floppy disk and they've got like 19 year olds who are uh, it's the least desirable grunt work is to sit down there in the bunker uh, and and guard the uh, codes in case the you know the red phone rings and it's, it's time to go to it uh, and it just shows how poorly maintained some of these facilities are um, and I, I, I'm with you. I wish this was far more of a, of a mainstream concern. And it's easy, I think, to get complacent, especially if you think of just the mushroom cloud, just that image that's the, the, the start of a video game and nothing more, as opposed to... Um, I've sort of lost that thought there, other than uh, I'm horrified and I want other people to be too, not to be paralyzed in fear, but because right. we want them to take action. We want them to get involved. Exactly, exactly. I want them to be able to see the seriousness and what could happen and that it's not just a maybe someday, you know, it, it could really, really happen. And I think it's so important that they start to read as much as they can on it or mostly get to understand the stories. Because I think when we start understanding the stories about people, you understand them better. You, your relationship is with them better when you see that commonality. And um, that's what I really hope more than anything that I'm bringing with this and that I'll continue to, to do, so. Let's, uh, let's talk about you and talk about writing. Esteemed audience, that's what they come for. That's, <laughs> you know what this show is. Uh, so there you are, you're 11 years old. At that point, how much, when your mother tells you that and you discover that there's this big secret you can't share with people, you've written an entire book about your mother's experience and it's wonderful, but what's your experience? What's that like to have that dropped on you at, at 11 years old? 
Well, first, I wasn't quite sure what the atomic bomb was. Um, and we know we didn't have internet or Google, so I couldn't look it up and kind of see what it was. Um, and I remember just the way that my mother said it, the way that she cried, just giving me the basics of just saying that that's what happened. Um, she was never one to show a lot of tears. So to see her do that when she was talking to me frightened me because I thought, well, this is really upsetting to her. And if her nightmares are happening because of those, um, you know, my first remembrance of her um, having a nightmare was five and she had this blood curdling scream that just woke me up from my sleep. And I remember that still so vividly. And she just told me, oh, it's a bad dream, don't worry about it. And I didn't think too much of it, but then when I'm 11 and I'm thinking something that she saw made her scream like that. And I, I was afraid, I was afraid, I was sad. Um, and then I wanted to know more and I was kind of upset that she wouldn't do it, but I had to respect that. Now, looking back at my 11 year old self, I think also my mother went through a lot of PTSD symptoms, which you know they didn't really diagnose when she was going through it first as a teenager and they didn't really talk about it much when I was young. Um, and so she had these bouts of depression, these weeks where she would just wanna stay in her room I never understood that, or she would be quick to, ang to be angry over something. And I just had to react to those because I didn't know what was going on. And so as I look at it now, I think there, you know, I was in the midst of watching her go through all of that and I didn't know how to process it. So my only way was to just, okay, I will forget about it for a while. And I really did. I didn't want to look up anymore. I didn't know how to deal with that. So when I was probably, I think it was like 13, 14 when we did go over Hiroshima and that was really when I wanted to know more about it and after I started reading that I remember feeling even worse um, and I I couldn't understand why she wouldn't want to talk about it because when I, I thought it would make her feel better but I had to respect what she kept telling me is don't tell anyone um, and I, I have to say that it, it made things very difficult for me and I was so glad when she finally did talk to me about it um, because I knew how hard it was for her to do that and to think that she lived with that inside of her, you know, all that time being afraid to talk about it uh, is, is what really touched me. And so I, I really, you know, my 11 year old self took it very hard in many different ways, you know, between feeling sad, being scared, um, not quite knowing exactly what that meant. Um, I tried to ask my dad a little bit, but he wouldn't talk about it. He, he is not Japanese, he is a white American, um, but he knew bits and pieces that my mother may have told him, but she didn't tell him very much either. So it was more or less being told every August to walk on eggshells. You don't want to upset your mother because this is a bad time for her. So you just kind of have to, you know, be very careful of what you do. It was a very tough month to see what she went through, but also because I knew if I did something, one least little thing wrong, you know, it could set her off, whether she'd be very depressed, whether she'd be angry. So it was really, it was not an easy road to do. I just did it at the time, but as I'm going through and I'm looking back, it's it's been, you know, it makes sense to me more now of seeing what she went through um, and why I reacted the way I did um, and not pestering her with a lot of questions, you know. I'm, I'm talking to you now as an adult, you've written an entire novel and you've had some time, I don't know that you can process the unfathomable, but you've had some time, I, I, I would think, to get some perspective. But at 11 years old, I know your mother had uh, affected an accent from Tokyo so people wouldn't know where she'd come from. She'd uh, cut herself out of old family photos. Was there a, a sense of uh, betrayal, resentment? Um, did, did any of that come into play or, or questioning of, of who you are if there's something this big has been hidden from you up to that point in your life? Well, I think part of it is I wish that I would have known more at that point. But I, I think, you know, growing up, it wasn't just the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, of what she went through with Hiroshima. There was a lot of issues between my parents. And so I think I had to deal so much with their parental, uh, their marital issues, that it was hard for me to really focus on any of that. And so I look back at that. Um, and what really comes to mind is, is as I'm researching my second book, and it's I'm talking about her um, PTSD symptoms and the stuff that she went through, it's bringing up a lot of what I did when I was a child or a teenager. And 
this is when I'm starting to realize how much it did affect me. Um, that you, you think you put things like pat them down so they're not there, but then all of a sudden something will jar your memory and it does totally bring back. And, and the feeling of being afraid of hurting her feelings or getting her angry. Um, and then that kind of makes me angry because I'm like, I wish you would have just said what happened so that we could help each other. You know, I mean, she eventually did. But I think the childhood might have been a teensy bit easier if I understood that it wasn't me <laughs> that she was upset at, you know, and that's kind of how I felt. So it was very hard to, to kind of deal with that. But that's, that's kind of another tangent. <laughs> I know you're, you said your daughter is planning to continue this work. She's going to continue spreading the message uh, beyond. So that's, that's three generations um, working and, and potentially a fourth eventually uh, that will continue to, to spread this message. How have you um, modified, uh, based on your experience, how have you explained this to her and, and talk, because it's a rough thing to, to tell anybody, uh, but especially to tell somebody 11, 12, which of course you're going around the, the country and, and, and doing that on a regular basis. So how do you break your news, break the news to your daughter without also, um, you know, imparting some sense of despair. Um, how, how do you approach that subject with her and prepare her? And then how also do you go about discussing this with the young people that you go out and you talk with? Okay, so the first part, um, I remember talking to Sarah first before I was gonna go to her class because I really didn't discuss it that much with her. She knew my mom was in Hiroshima growing up but we didn't really talk much more about it. And so I told her what my mother had told me and I think it's hard because I get emotional when I get to certain parts of it. And um, because my mother would get so emotional. And I think it was a little tough for my daughter to see that at first, you know, to, to see that kind of emotion and um, to think of her grandma who, you know, at this point in time, we were in North Carolina, but prior to that, we lived in Rhode Island. And so we were very close to my parents. My daughter saw them almost every other day. And when I was sick, she spent a lot of time with them too. So she had this other version of, of her grandma, you know, who was loving and doting. And then she found out that there was this other side that, that was so much pain for her. And I think it was very hard for her to handle it. Um, but being able to talk about it more so with me back and forth than what I had an opportunity to do with my mom, I think it helped some as well. She could also see that my mom you know, she came through it, you know, and by that point she was in her seventies. Um, but she also had her own issues with me being sick. So I think that put a different layer for her because she was dealing with my physical illness and what went with that, knowing that the illness I had had something to do with the atomic bombing. And so how much it affects the, the various generations, so to speak, either, you know, mentally or physically. Um, but I have to say, she's very strong. She was very helpful in, in with me with the book in reading it. And I, I got her opinion on, you know, you're around 12, 13. Does this make sense to you with this, you know? Um, and when she finished reading it, she said to me, I cried when I read the last two chapters and I don't normally do that, but you made me cry. And she says, and I don't think it was just because I knew it was grandma. It was just because the whole situation. So she said, if you can bring half of that out, you know, with, with, with other people, then, they're gonna understand this a lot more. And, and that was very encouraging for me. And, and she has been um, throughout this, someone who continues to talk about my mom's story, even if I'm not with her, which is amazing. You know, in, in college, she was in the Japan club. She minored in Japanese. So she'll be the one that can read it and speak it. I cannot do either. I only know a few choice phrases and numbers, um, but she spearheaded a lot of things at her school to get the word out. Um, as far as we did a, a peace tree um, that with Green Legacy Hiroshima, part of the United Nations. And what they do is they grow saplings from the seeds of um, A-bomb trees that survived. And we were able to plant a sapling at UNC Wilmington because my daughter got involved and then her Japanese professor so that we could plant it and dedicate it there um, to make North Carolina the seventh state in the US to actually have one of these peace trees. And I feel that even though I wasn't physically there, she's spreading the message and we're able to now, we've got a tree that she was part of that also has a plaque that describes what it's for and um, it will continue. So when I talk with students, 
Uh, a lot of times they have read the book, but um, if I if they haven't, and even afterwards, uh, you know, I also try to start off with the history and the culture, and then I kind of come into it more about what happened that day. And it's really hard, I guess, to kind of prepare them for it. I, I think I just let my emotions be what they are, and I think they kind of speak for me instead of me saying something all the time. Um, and when I will describe an, an event that my mother went through, I'll read from the book. Um, it's interesting because you'll have a group of middle schoolers or high schoolers, and I've had like maybe a hundred once when we could be in person in an auditorium, and nobody is talking. Everything is so quiet, especially after I finish, and I wonder if, you know, what I've done to them, and what they'll end up saying is that they took it in, and it really meant something to them, and even, and, you know, some of them will have tears, and then I feel bad, but I've had students tell me, don't because we understand this better now. We had no idea before. And to feel this, um, you know, they'll come up and they'll, you know, they, my mother was alive um, when I was starting to speak about it and they would say, thank her for us, for, for being so brave to tell this story. Um, because at that age, a lot of a middle school, it's hard to be brave. You get a lot of stuff that's happened in middle school that's not always so great. And to, to know that something like that stuck with them um, it just, it really touches me. And, you know, my mom was very brave to let her story be told, you know, and she, she trusted myself and my daughter, you know, with, with her memories of this, something that she didn't trust very many people with. Um, and, and so I really feel that her strength, it emboldens me to want to make sure that other people can hear about it. And it really touches my heart when students will say that after I've finished speaking, how much it's changed their point of view on certain things. Um, I'll get letters later that they'll say that they've heard, um, whether it be at their dinner table or at school when there was something going on with another country, they might say, you know, we could just usually nuke them. And she said, I actually stopped and I talked to them about what that really meant and that it wasn't like a game. Um, and that was, so meaningful to me and I feel like if you reach one person with that you know um I, I'm gonna get choked up so I um being able to to, to share that and to, to know that students are understanding it and getting the message from all of that um means a lot to me and I can kind of continue my mother's you know she called us the three Ishikawa women Ishikawa was her maiden name and um I hope that you know she can really see what we've been doing for her um she always felt it was for her papa and she never quite understood I was doing it to honor her also um and as as a case in point for this in November of 2014 I received my publishing contract so I remember showing it to my mother so she took the contract and she put it next to that photo and she said well now he can know how you can honor him and she said you know I never knew why I was still alive when I lost everyone and everything and she said but it was to have you I can't tell my story but you will do it for me and and that just <sighs> It, it means so much to me that I could do that for her. I, okay, I'm gonna. <clears throat> All right, well, let's. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that got extremely emotional, but it was so gratifying, uh, I, I would think, uh, because that had to be a, a, a tremendous amount of work. Let's, let's pivot a bit to writing, because this is just a tremendous undertaking. It had to have been. I, I don't know if you, had you wanted to be a writer prior to deciding to embark on this? I really did. I still would write, try to write short stories, try to write poems, even while I was doing my other work in hospital administration. Um, and so I was really excited to be able to kind of put more to it. Uh, and it did. <laughs> it was a lot more than I thought it was going to be. And, and one of the th best things I think I, for me that I did was to join the Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators because I started going to conferences and I was able to meet with editors and to attend workshops. And then I realized just how hard <laughs> it was going to be. To, it wasn't just putting some facts together. And 
Um, part of it too is the writing that I did was, um, I don't know, well, more fiction wise than historical. And even though it's historical fiction, I pretty much have an idea that I'm basing it on some of what she said, uh, what happened to her, um, but the fictionalized is more or less the, the dates of when it happens in her life, some things I had to move around or the conversations and some other um, scenes. But for the most part with the historical fiction and what worried me is that I need to get the history right. You know, I did a lot of research because I didn't want to be the author that somebody would say, oh, well, they didn't have that back then and they wouldn't have used it or they wouldn't have said that in Japan. Um, so it took me a long time to try to find the right sources uh, and to find something in English about daily life in Japan. So <laughs> during the war was not exactly easy. Um, but oddly enough, eBay was my friend and it had a lot of weeded out library books that had been translated. Some of them that did talk about life during the war. So that was really very helpful. And, and I think, you know, I used my mom a lot to ask her, you know, well, does this make sense? Is this what your house looked like? You know, and, and she would tell me if I got it right or wrong. Uh, and then I made a point of also reading other people's um, experience from the bombing so that I could kind of get a fuller picture because I feel that everybody being in a different spot in Hiroshima or with your family, um, that I could get that kind of nuance to it as well. And it took, I, I, I do love to research. So I think it kind of takes you down that rabbit hole where <laughs> you can spend hours on doing it. Um, but the other piece of it is that my sickness started to um, progress a little bit more. And so it started off with the, uh, the, the left leg um, and it spread to the right foot and then it spread to my hands. And so even, let's see, this would have been eight years ago, um, I had a lot of trouble using my hands as much as I wanted. And so trying to do research, and I'm the type of person, because I'm old, I like to use pen and paper, you know, to get my thoughts. That's how I think best. So it was a lot harder to do because I couldn't always hold the pen. Um, and I couldn't always type. So when the pain would be too bad, I would just have to give it up and I wouldn't be able to do it. So that really got in the way. So I had to fight with that piece of it because when you're in pain, you can't always think the way you would wanna think clearly. And um, it takes a lot out of you. And so I, I really fought a lot with the physical side as well as, as trying to get all the research in for that. Um, and wanting to portray it in a way so that it does have that emotional piece to it. And, you know, when it was being submitted to various uh, publishing houses, you know, sometimes I did get this question of, well, what lens are you telling this through? Are you telling it through your American lens or your Japanese lens? And I'm like, why can't it just be through a 12 year old lens of what this girl's going through? Um, I didn't want, it wasn't political. It wasn't a fact of saying do or don't. It, it was a matter of this is what happened. Uh, and, and I'm glad I stuck with that because at times it was hard. I, you know, even my own father would tell me, I don't know if you should do this. You know, it could cause some problems. People may not like it. And, and, uh, it was tough to kind of fight through that, but my husband and my daughter, they were egging me on. I had friends that were, you know, on my side and, uh, my mom was on my side and that was the most important because I was telling her story. If she would have really told me, don't do it. I wouldn't have done it out of respect. But because she was willing to let that piece of her be, be seen, um, I felt that, you know, that was my, my mission at that time was to get that story out there and to kind of fight for it in a way where a lot of, well, a lot of the publishers wanted it to start after the bombing. But to me, that doesn't tell the story enough. Um, everybody knows that the bombing happened, but they don't know what happened beforehand. And I think by being able to do that, made a huge difference. And to, you know, once I found the editor who was, um, who felt the same way, who um, wanted to be able to stick to some of the traditions in Japan, trying to make it seem as, uh, to get the Japanese culture without it looking, um, uh, without it being too much, without the conversations being too stilted because the way they spoke was a little bit different. There was a lot more proper speaking than there was, you know, no contractions or anything like that. So it was a matter of trying to figure that out as well and to make sure that the timeline would work correctly within that. So it was a very long process, um, but in the end, 
it was worth it. And I'm finding that it's going to be a long process with the second book also, which is why it's taken me so long to kind of get to that um, because of the way my health has been. Um, it's taken a toll on me. So it's not as easy to, to do what I would like to do. So. Uh, so I'm trying to trying trying to get my emotions uh, in check so I can I can responsibly ask the next question. I just want to ask about writing uh, about your mother um, because when you're doing that, there has to be a fine line. Your mother's your protagonist because you still has to be the protagonist of the novel with with some faults, with some strengths. Um, you don't want to lionize her completely. You don't want to take out whatever the things she did that annoyed you the last family gathering. You <laughs> so how, what's what's the process of, of turning your mother into the protagonist of your novel? Well, the interesting thing is, is I think that we don't always think of our parents as being young. You know, they didn't have a life before we came along, you know, so trying to picture her as a, as a 12 year old. And my mother though, she said to me, don't portray me as perfect. She says, I was not the perfect little polite, you know, as they like to think of, you know, Japanese society is just, she said, I did cause trouble. I didn't like my cousin that lived in the house. I wasn't always friendly to him. You know, she says, I didn't like to clean my room. I hated to do homework, but, the, but I loved my papa and I loved doing this with him. And, and so it was interesting um, that she kind of gave that to me. And at one point, <laughs> When I had wrote her um, and I was sending it out to various agents, you know, one of them said to me, I think you got to make her a little bit nicer. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> so there was a way to balance. I didn't know how to balance. And, and so I did learn that. But um, it was very interesting in how she said that and how she thought that it should be portrayed so that it would show the, the differences of her. But then I got stuck because I had, well, this is all the stuff that happened in her life. How do I put that into this larger scene? And so what I ended up doing is, um, you know, I had all of her events on one timeline and then I started to do like a timeline of what I wanted to include in there and see how they could mesh together. Cause I got too stuck up, stuck on my mother's, you know, specifics. And that really slowed me down for a while. But, in, but once I got past that and I tried to think about, well, if I was 12 and I had this cousin that was living with us that annoyed me, you know, how would I act if I would do something like that? And my mom would actually say that a lot of times I got it pretty good. So I was really happy <laughs> with that piece of it. Um, so. <laughs> if you've got mom's permission to go ahead and make her not perfect, that has to be a tremendous help. <laughs> yes, I was very appreciative of that. I don't know if I'd be that willing if Sarah said, I'm going to write about you. Well, <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> if my son wants to write about me, write the first draft now, buddy, but maybe publish it after I'm gone. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so how long, uh, how long did the book take you from, from initial research to completion to contract? How long are we talking? Uh, seven years seven years. Now, part of that is because of my illness. Part of that was it took a year of submitting to get an agent. And then we went back and forth with versions. And then once it was good enough to be submitted, that took another year. Um, and so, and then for the publication piece of it, that was two years after the contract was signed. So it was even longer, you know, it was nine years total before it got out there. Um, but uh, it, it was very interesting because you learn, well, as you know, too, when you're trying to publish things and get stories out, it takes a little bit longer than what you would originally expect they would and how you're, how you're going to, to, to do things. And so um, it took a while, but I'm glad that my mother at least read the draft of it, one of the drafts, um, because she passed away three months after I showed her that contract. So um, she never did get to see the actual book come out, but she had an idea of what was going to be in there. And I had her blessing for that. So, uh. <laughs> Well, she knew that you were on a mission and that you were going to complete it. Yeah, she did. She said well, that she knew well. that I would do it for her and do it well. So That raises a, another question. Because I know you've been, uh, obviously you're on this show, uh, tremendous, but you've also been on PBS, you've been on many NPR uh, stations, you've been in multiple magazines. I watched uh, part of a Japanese newscast featuring you, and then of course uh, you were at NATO, right? Uh, giving speeches and signing books. Mm -hmm. So, and you've been in schools across the country. This is a huge mission, spreading this awareness. 
is there a way to ever feel like it's complete or is it going to be ongoing forever? I sadly think it will be ongoing, at least for the, the time being that I can do it, I would think. Um, I, I think it's going to take some time for, for everything to, well, if we could get to where we had no nuclear weapons. But the, I, I think that the message is going to have to take some time to get out there. So I, I don't I don't foresee it being finished, but I also am happy that I get to talk with the students. You know, I really do love being able to do that. I love writing and to be able to get back to it. And, and that is the, for the time that I'm allowed to write before the pain really sets in, it puts me someplace else. You know, it doesn't take the pain away, but it kind of takes my head away from it for a little while. And it's very cathartic for me. Um, and I really do enjoy that piece of it. And so I try to work on other types of stories if I'm, if, so that it's not just constantly on some more emotional issues as far as like my mother's book and doing the sequel, you know? So I'm trying to look at other historical things that have happened and, and try to see how I want to write about those. And it really has helped a lot on the bad pain days. You know, even if I can only write a page in, in a journal, at least it's something. And I can consider that I did something today because there are some days when the flare ups are really bad that I can't you know, get out of bed and, and I can't even focus to read something or to watch something on TV. So I'll use I listen to audiobooks a lot. And um, and I think that that also helps me to want to be creative because the more you read and the more you talk to authors and the more that you listen to books, the more that it um, if you're creative and you like to be an author, I think the more that it inspires you you know, to, to want to do that, to use that creativity. And um, I know you have a lot of it because I've been reading your book and I just find that that's so, um, I'm sure that in some way it helps take you from, you know, whatever's going on and pr puts you someplace else and you can be, use your creativity. And um, I, I just think that writing helps a lot with me physically and emotionally through this. Again, I think I got off tangent, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing a tangent away. My show is your show. Go for it. <laughs> well, You're kind. Comment. Before I started doing this show, uh, well, well before, uh, when I first started writing, I could occasionally indulge in the fantasy that this is really good. I might be the greatest writer who ever lived. This might be the most amazing book that will ever be. Uh, and then, of course, reality set in. People pointed out all the reasons that... You know, the basic improvement journey that I think every author takes. But then doing this show, I'm like, oh, no, I'm not even in the top 50% oh. of writers talking talking with uh, so many authors, so many credit. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being self-deprecating, of course, but it does give a sense of perspective of you've got to bring your A game. Look how many amazing authors are out there in the world. And if there's a chance that somebody might read my book instead of one of theirs, you got to make sure that it's up to par. Very true. It is a lot harder, I think, than you realize until once you get into it um, and, and how there are so many great writers out there and how it takes so long to sometimes be discovered and that, you know, that you sometimes you will have that person who gets picked right away out of the slush pile. You know, that happens. But the majority of the time, it's more of redoing, submitting. And then it's the, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but there's so much subjectivity when it comes to judging your writing. You know, I, I would get something from one publishing house saying, oh, I love the voice of this character, but you know, I wasn't quite sure about the setting. And then somebody else would say, oh, I love the setting. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure about the voice. And you're going, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, who, who am I going to please? And I guess then too, um, you know, if, if, if you, have faith in what you're doing and you want to keep pushing through, then you, you know where you want to be. And I think that's what you keep striving to go. And eventually you will find, you know, that editor, that person who wants to support you with the message that you're trying to bring. They may need you to change a few things, but they'll get it, you know, just where you're seeing it. And I think at times I was really wondering, do I have to change what I'm doing and how I'm presenting the story? And I'm glad that eventually I really didn't. But I know you think about it because when you get rejections, nobody likes that. But I've also found if you really want to write, then you just really got to keep at it. And you have to write it not because you want to be a bestseller. Because I'll tell you, middle grade fiction, debut author, you're not making a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just you're talking to me on a golden laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, <laughs> um, so you really have to write because you just want to so badly. And 
you know, I know that sometimes you ask this question, and maybe I'm going too early, about what to say to other aspiring writers or authors or, you know, and, and, and my thought has always been is that don't wait for that perfect time. You know, because at times I would say, well, I'll write it later, I'll do this, but then I got sick and it was kind of like, okay, so now how do you realign things? Um, but to just write that first sentence or draft because you can fix it later, but you can at least start. And I think sometimes once you get on a roll of doing that, then you, you kind of get into some pattern in how you're writing. And if you keep waiting for that day to do it or waiting to find that right person who's going to agree with you, um, you know, you may never get to write that really great book. And so to me, it's like just, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be come from the heart. And then you can kind of work from there um, as far as that goes. And that's what I keep reminding myself when I'm trying to do myself. <laughs> you can replay this clip uh, the next time you're, you're thinking about not Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the writer today that I sounded like when I was exactly. on happens to me all the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, for all of my workshop students who are, are listening, who hand me crummy excuses about why they didn't do their writing, because uh, there was a TV show they really wanted to watch, and they just didn't feel it on a day. With you who are dealing, you have a, a very good excuse not to write. You've got physical pain. You've got things that, that would stop you. Have you overcome that? What does your writing day look like when you're dealing with that? Um, well, on a, a bad pain day, I'm usually my best time is the morning. So I'm usually up very, very early and I have my coffee and then I just try to write in my own journal to kind of see if I'm going to have the energy or the wherewithal to try to work on, you know, an actual book. Um, and I, I take that first half hour of just kind of writing anything that comes to mind. And then if I'm not as in much pain, then I decide, all right, well, then maybe I'll try to open up my, you know, where I am with my writing for that. Um, but I also have to be, I'm my own worst critic and I get very upset with myself if I can't just sit there and write. I wish I could do it for two hours straight, but I can't. And I've tried to train myself so that I kind of set a timer so that I can stop maybe rest a little bit or do something else and then come back to it and do it again. So maybe I can get more time. And I used to always be more like, I got to do so many thousand words at once, or I got to do two hours in a chunk. And for some people, they, you know, obviously that works for them. But for me, I kind of had to learn for, okay, if you went two hours straight, you're not gonna be able to move <laughs> afterwards. You're going to really be suffering and then you lose tomorrow on top of it. So it was more of trying to balance how that is. Um, but like I said, with the writing, I do find myself to be most happy on the days that I really get a chance to, to write, even if it's just to research and to write some notes. I, I just, I don't know, it energizes me and it, it refocuses me um, and it just kind of inspires me to want to keep doing it. And I think of my mom and I think of the strength that she had to, to, to go through what she went through, to move to another country, to deal with the prejudice that she dealt with. So that kind of emboldens me that, okay, well, she could do that. I can try a half hour of writing and see how my pain level is and, and, and kind of go from, from there. So that's usually what I use to, to energize me. I am going to play that for every workshop. <laughs> that I am really going forward. Well, I'm watching our, our, our time and I know we're, we're coming right to the very uh, end of, of, of where we said we did it. And I should call it because it's been amazing. Uh, we've, we've had passed so many great notes to, to, to end on, but esteemed audience knows I can't resist and I won't let you down. I got to ask, uh, Kathleen Birkenshaw, have you ever seen a ghost or a flying saucer? Well, we went on this Savannah trip once and we did one of those nighttime uh, ghost tours. And I don't know, they were kind of some shadowy figures. I don't know exactly what they were and maybe they were by certain types of lights. I'm not really sure but um, I kind of thought I saw something. And my mom had also said when she was growing up, and I think I mentioned it. Um, no, I, I didn't mention this part of it. She said they would go to the country house, but there would be something that she would see and she wasn't sure what it was. You know, and of course, then she had this, her aunt would say to her, oh, it was this, you know, bad ancient samurai, you're going to be sorry. And that would kind of scare her. But she said, no, it was some kind of a, you know, just a, comforting presence so it, it's it's just interesting and and you know I, I always feel like when I need my mom the most a cardinal will come in 
you know, into my yard and she'll come right up to the patio door. And it's every time it was from the, the moment that she passed, a cardinal came to the window. And so that's just kind of a thing when I seem to need her the most, there she is. When I went to go do my first book thing, there was a picture of a cardinal, you know, on their bulletin board. So it was just kind of like, so to me, that's what I'm seeing and that's what I'm feeling. <laughs> I am so glad that we are now have arrived at the perfect note to end on. That's <laughs> we did it. Uh, you've been just an absolute uh, delight to talk to. I really appreciate you. You're making the time and uh, and, and and sharing uh, your, your and sharing with a uh, with esteemed audience. Where can esteemed audience find you online? Follow you on social media, all that good stuff. Sure. Uh, my website is www.kathleenberkinshaw.com. That also has links to my blog and to information on school visits. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at KL Birkinshaw, the number one after it. Also on um, Facebook, it is author Kathleen Birkinshaw. And Instagram is at Kathleen Birkinshaw. So I try to post on all of those, not always on a regular basis, but um, all the information basically is on my website that you can find. So thank you. Uh, esteemed audience, as always, go to middlegradeninja.com for everything that's good in the world. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot mm -hmm. Bean. Read The Last Cherry Blossom by Kathleen Birkinshaw. Um, share it with uh, with the young people in your life and with everyone you know. Help spread this message and and get everybody that we can involved in doing what we can to prevent future tragedies like this uh, from happening again. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week. Thank you.